Uh, I still see people connecting, uh, so maybe we should wait for a, a minute longer. But I am recording now so that uh, you have to temper your remarks uh, to what you can face up to in 20 years. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, and I won't be around in 20 years. Uh, but um, we start off with two bits of um, administrivia. One is um, basically we are gathered here under the aegis of Hyperledger, which is under the Linux Foundation. So we have to abide by the antitrust policy of Linux Foundation. And wherever you are, that means you're not engaging in antitrust policy that is contrary to counter to your uh, laws. The second item is that we abide by the code of conduct, which is basically we do not disrespect each other when we, even when we are disagreeing with people. Disagreements are fine as long as you express it nicely and stick to the points that are being discussed rather than personalities. That, with that, I uh, gave out, uh, give up over the presentation to Brett and Jake, who are going to lead us through the finality solution. And we will, of course, uh, have, hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Uh, uh, and that's, that's about it for me. And I'll you know, give over the presentation to both of the, these guys. Thank you very much, Vipin. Uh, really appreciate your time and for everyone on the call as well, thanks for joining. Uh, fantastic to take the opportunity to present today uh, to this group. Um, if it makes sense to everyone on the call, the running order for today's ses session is to uh, uh, give a recap of some of the work that Finality uh, ha has been up to, uh, really from kind of the the early days of the of the USC consortium to the present day where you know considerable amount of progress has been made in the interim uh, uh, the, the value that we plan to bring to the market and some up, upcoming uh, anticipated activity too um so uh Brett I don't know if you uh if we want to introduce ourselves first I'll hand it over to you oh yeah thanks much Jake um yeah likewise very uh, happy to be here and thanks for the invite but um yeah as way of an introduction my name is Brett Winch and I'm a architect at finality Jake perfect um and uh, I work on business development at finality I've been here for uh, uh, around 18 months um collaborate closely with uh, Brett and uh, all, the, all the other folks at finality international on the uh, commercialization of the finality proposition so um if uh, all's well and good, I'll dive right into the presentation. So around uh, four years ago, a few blockchain and DLT enthusiasts uh, from within the financial services sector decided to uh, put their brains together and explore how the uh, tokenization of assets, most notably cash, um, could benefit and change financial market infrastructure. Um, fast forward to 2019 and what had by then become a consortium uh, had proven three fundamental prerequisites uh, for a means of payment on chain to be uh, useful, impactful, and effective. Uh, first and foremost, it needed to be available in multiple currencies to enable cross border payments. Uh, it needed to uh, be interoperable with other systems um, to support uh, payment versus payment and delivery versus payment transactions. Uh, and it needed to be a digital representation of money held in a central bank account uh, to ensure that institutions. Uh, could rely upon its value. So with these fundamentals having been proven, uh, the consortium members that you can see uh, on the right there uh, brought this vision closer to the realm of reality by establishing Finality International, uh, uh, raising, uh, uh, doing a successful series, series A fundraise uh, uh, along the way. So we have 15 shareholders, uh, 14 of which are banks and uh, one FMI in the form of NASDAQ. Uh, 
with these fundamentals in place, uh, it was now over to the nascent Finality International to focus on developing a series of peer-to-peer -peer payment systems uh, built using DLT uh, and supported by a uh, central bank money-backed digital cash asset. So we knew from the very start that uh, this could only be achieved through regulator understanding and approval, uh, a robust best-in-class technology build, which will, of course, touch on quite extensively throughout this session, uh, and collaboration with business partners as well to facilitate uh, a variety of use cases. Um, on the regulator point, uh, we adopted, and we always have adopted, uh, an ask for permission approach uh, with regulators. Uh, the alternative, presumably, being to uh, beg for forgiveness after the fact. And uh, as a result, we've made significant strides in education and collaborative thinking uh, that will enable each of the central banks in scope to, uh, to grant finality an account from which we can operate a finality payment system. More on that later on all of the terminology and the general structure of our solution. Um, on the technology point, uh, our tech has been built using a systems integrator approach, uh, which means that we've partnered with uh, best in class vendors for blockchain, blockchain expertise, software development, testing, quality assurance, uh, and, uh, and more, which Brett will uh, talk about uh, later on in the presentation. So with that said, from an introductory perspective, uh, I'll move on to provide a overview of the broader financial market environment in which we're operating. If you see me turning away from the screen, it's just because I've got a second month to set up. Sorry, I'm not being rude. Um, so what are the issues in uh, today's financial markets that we believe a novel distributed financial market infrastructure can solve for? So starting from the on the top row there, uh, in terms of process inefficiency, uh, post-trade costs in particular remain high. Uh, there's less automation at the back end than the front end. And what this means is that there are heightened costs associated with matching, clearing, settlement, and reconciliations. Um, uh, there are also liquidity constraints. Liquidity pools uh, are fragmented across products and across jurisdictions to support uh, a range of disjointed uh, activities. And this is both challenging and costly uh, to manage. On risk management, the complexity of risk management uh, due to this fragmentation and the need to use uh, multiple other intermediaries, such as correspondent banks, there's, there's a greater risk exposure, whether that's counterparty uh, liquidity or, or settlement risk. Um, and all of this means that margins are reducing this, you know, due to all of that, but also a downwards pressure on uh, execution revenues caused by front end automation regulation demanding uh, greater fee transparency and pressures from from uh, customers too. Um, the fifth point on the top row there, and you know, to my mind, a particularly interesting one, new markets, uh, particularly those in tokenized assets, will need payment rails for the uh, for the payment leg of any delivery versus payment transaction. Um, and at the moment, there are myriad tokenized assets in existence and plenty of exchanges on which to transact in them. But what's missing is uh, an on-chain cash asset with the credit characteristics of central bank money. And that's needed to really bring an institutional level of trust to these nascent markets and fully unlock the potential of that, that novel asset class along the way. So onto the second row, how can a distributed uh, financial market infrastructure address these challenges and create new opportunities in the process? Um, a reduction in intermediaries, uh, as you see there, through the use of a peer-to-peer -peer -peer transaction uh, mechanism can assist in the reduction uh, of the risk and costs that the current state entails. Um, and the single pool of liquidity, uh, uh, as, as mentioned there, is a concept that we at Finality get particularly excited about. And what that means is that with the linkage of a real-time uh, PVP capability to, uh, to the ability to settle any DVP transaction on a near instant basis, uh, a participant is empowered to carry out near real-time currency swaps to support DVP settlement in any given market. Um, and the practical effect of that is that uh, participants can manage virtually the entirety of their cash and collateral portfolio uh, from a single pool of liquidity rather than via the parking of capital across various fragmented uh, nostros, correspondence, and domestic CSDs, et cetera. Um, risk reduction also comes about as a con uh, consequence of fewer reconciliations, short transaction chains, disintermediation. Uh, a reduction in costs can be achieved through near real-time settlement, uh, the disintermediated peer-to-peer -peer nature of the transaction and greater automation of post-trade processes. Um, and on the enablement of new products, uh, I touched on the specific case of tokenized markets above, uh, but enhanced access 
to a financial market infrastructure of this nature can also create new opportunities. Uh, as uh, will become clear on the next slide, uh, you know, we, we intend to start with banks as finality payment system participants, but uh, you know, a longer term intention uh, would be to, uh, or might be to bring other parties to the table subject to regulator approval, um, institutions like CCP, CSDs, buy side, and perhaps broader still, all of which offer new potential avenues for faster, cheaper, and safer payments and settlement. So um, moving on to the next slide, with all of that in mind, how do we plan to bring this distributed financial market infrastructure or DFMI uh, to life and realize the benefits that it brings? Well, we plan to develop a group of payment systems that as a whole constitute finality global payments. Uh, each jurisdictional finality payment system, uh, for example, the Sterling uh, FMPS as illustrated in the first box there, um, will utilize a settlement asset that enables real-time wholesale payments with near instant peer-to-peer -peer settlement. Uh, and together, these jurisdictional finality payment systems comprise finality global payments illustrated in the second box there, uh, which is a network of interoperable wholesale payment systems uh, that enable near instant peer -peer PVP settlement on a cross-border basis. Uh, initially then, uh, Finality Global Payments will consist uh, of a network of five uh, FNPSs uh, for each of sterling, dollar, euro, yen, and uh, Canadian dollar, with the Swiss franc also likely to be uh, in initial scope. Um, and one of the primary positive outcomes of this network of networks is the uh, dramatic reduction in risk, be it settlement, replacement cost, uh, credit counterparty risk, uh, that T, uh, T0 T plus zero settlement times and 24 seven availability uh, will provide. So it's worth noting also, uh, particularly given uh, pr presumably the focus and interest of many people in this working group, uh, that we're architecting our payment systems with both forwards facing and backwards facing interoperability in mind, uh, as touched on finally in the third box uh, there. So the concept of a, uh, you know, as I said, a, a quote unquote single pool of liquidity is something that we we do get very excited about, and uh, the uh, that's only possible with uh, the linkage of a real-time PVP capability to the ability to settle any DVP transaction atomically, uh, yeah, and on and on a near instant basis. Um, and uh, all finality payment systems uh, to facilitate that functionality not only are interoperable with each other, but also interoperable with any legacy or DLT-based uh, business application enabling uh, that functionality. Um, the previous point around emerging tokenized uh, markets, as I say, requires payment rails for the payment leg of any D DDP transaction uh, in such a market. And that's also reiterated there. Uh, what is really needed is an on-chain cash asset with the credit characteristics of central bank money to bring trust uh, to these uh, uh, emerging tokenized markets and fully unlock the potential of that uh, novel asset class. So on to the uh, design principles that guide the delivery uh, of this vision before we move on uh, to a deeper dive into you know, our technical architecture choices that, that are informed by this. So uh, as mentioned, each jurisdictional finality payment system will utilize uh, a settlement asset that enables real-time wholesale payments with near instant settlement. Uh, and this will be a, an asset of the highest order in that it's fixed one-to-one -one with central bank money and hence has a very favorable risk profile. Um, a quick terminology point to eliminate any lingering confusion. I know we touched on it before the recording started, um, but Finality started its life as a research project, which grew into a consortium for, uh, for, for financial institutions, exploring how blockchain and DLT could use uh, uh, digital cash assets to settle securities trade. Um, and this consortium became known as the Utility Settlement Coin or USC project, which many of you uh, may have heard of. And, in some cases, that, that might be how you came to know about finality uh, in the first place. Um, in parallel, of course, however, the broader DLT space continued to develop uh, with the result that referring to a token or a coin in, in, in this case uh, began to cause quite a bit of confusion in the market and made regulatory bodies uneasy too. So what was formally referred to as the as utility settlement coin is merely the settlement asset that enables atomic and final settlement uh, in on-chain exchange of value transactions. It's certainly not a stable coin. And as such, we have moved away from references to USC and now focus, uh, as you saw on the previous slide, and as you can see here on finality global payments as the group of payment systems 
uh, and finality uh, uh, payment system to refer to a single payment system within that network. Um, so to achieve uh, the, uh, the design principles that you see here, uh, Finality Global Payments uses DLT uh, as its foundational technology. Um, a core rationale for this uh, is that it enables interoperability across jurisdictions uh, and enables other business platforms to integrate with the Finality payment system to support all manner of uh, exchange of value transactions. Uh, and inherent in the nature of DLT, as I'm sure everyone well knows, is, is that it will enable a full and final settlement without the need for a central counterpart or intermediary, uh, thus facilitating a true peer-to-peer -peer market and uh, allowing for immediate settlement whilst also reaping the cost, of finish, cost and efficiency benefits of uh, disintermediated processes. So uh, this is an arrangement which stands to provide uh, multiple benefits, uh, which we'll discuss later after Brett provides uh, more of a deep dive into our technical architecture choices. Excellent, thanks so Jake. Um, I suppose before I go into more of the lower level technical um, overview, uh, just want to stop for an opportunity to ask any questions on uh, what Jake has just gone through. Otherwise well, we can, uh... there, there are bound to be many questions, but I, I suggest you go through the, um, you know, your presentation because otherwise the rest of the session might be taken up with the questions. Sure, okay, no worries. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, without further ado, um, so further to the slides that Jake just went through outlining um, what a finality payment system is. So I just want to take you through a, a very high level architecture view of the technology stack. Um, by uh, all means, if anyone wants to go into a bit more of the lower level detail offline, we, we can certainly have those discussions, um, but obviously it will be in the realms of what uh, finality can share that's publicly available. But um, yeah, so looking at the, the diagram in front of you from the bottom up. So the foundation is of the Finality payment system is based on a private Ethereum uh, network of blockchain nodes. Um, Finality has chosen Hyperledger Bezu uh, as the uh, enterprise Ethereum client of choice uh, for that. And uh, to further bolster um, the development of that where Finality is an active member of the enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the EEA. Um, and the reason for that is we, we wish to continue to drive towards open standards, um, particularly around that uh, interoperability point that Jake raised earlier. Um, moving further up the stack, um, IBFT2 is the consensus me uh, mechanism, uh, the proof of authority mechanism. However, with, with that close eye on the market, um, we have started to look at the implications of the, the more recent QBFT um uh, consensus mechanism and and it's something that we'll be watching closely to understand how that fits into our technology stack as it progresses um sitting on top of that so the the digital asset that holds the transferred value onto the blockchain network is an adaptation of erc20 um, so in this case it's um uh, it's called erc2020 and it is the asset token contract smart contract that, uh, that holds that value on the, on the blockchain network, certainly facilitating the fund, defund and transfer of, of, of value onto the blockchain node network. Um, throughout all of this, uh, Finality has a set of core technology architecture principles that all of this is based on. Um, and those, those three principles are decentralized, distributed and diverse. So when we say decentralized, I think it goes without saying, but um, just having no central point of control. Um, distributed in that there are no single points of failure. Um, everyone can see the same view independently. And wherever possible, we, we strive for open source. Um, we we want to make sure that we're not beholden to a specific technology. Um, yeah, just, just keeping this really as open as we can. Uh, and finally, diverse. So making sure we've got an ag agnostic approach to design, hosting, um, software and tooling that we use um, and ensuring that we um, maintain uh, geographic separation for each of the jurisdictions that we operate in. Um, Jake, do you mind moving slides?
So um, this is just uh, taking you through um, some of the research that was done on the finality payment system uh, as we were evaluating uh, DLT-based technology options. This is no means an exhaustive list in front of you, as I'm sure you can um, you can you can see. But um, it's just to give you a bit of a flavour of the the selection criteria that finality went through in order to get to the technology choices that we we mentioned on that previous slide. So um, public Ethereum, um, that, that was one of the early, early options that we, we investigated. Um, I think the key takeaway here is that because it's public and permissionless by nature, uh, it means that anyone participating uh, uh, on it can achieve consensus. Um, one of the key legal aspects is it does not provide the deterministic settlement finality that, that we require. And the scalability is out of uh, finality's control and limited to roughly 15 transactions per second. Uh, one of the other options on the table, um, Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, I think the main point here to consider is um, that the nodes are differentiated and hence they can act as a source of centralization. So just going back to those key principles that we mentioned before, that, that's quite quite a big uh, big block for us, big issue for us to overcome. Um, scalability, it's, it fits perfectly. Um, however, I think just the main thing there is it's the, the diversion away from the finality core technology architectural principles that, that really make that one a difficult choice. Um, and just, just really driving home that, that the main thing uh, that finality is trying to drive here is, is building towards open and operate uh, interoperable standards and always constantly checking the landscape that we work in. So as, as new solution options come up, um, we, we actively uh, look to investigate those and make sure that we, we consider that in our long-term strategic goals. Uh, next slide, please, Jake. Okay, what we what we want to get out here is um, so at the heart of of the finality global payment solution uh, are key outcomes that we set out to achieve to drive value for our consumers and our participants. Um, so top left is interoperability. Um, so basically, we set out to support any number of use cases with our consumers uh, and our participants. So specifically in the multi currency payment versus payment a PVP and the multi-asset delivery versus payment uh, DVT, DVP settlement space. Um, but that's, yeah, we're, we're really trying to create an, an ecosystem here that allows us to, to uh, greatly um, increase the, the use cases of the, the underlying Finality Global Payments Network. Um, privacy, so, it's very key for us to ensure that uh, any personal identifying information is not stored on the finality payment system blockchain node network. Um, there are uh, there are ways that uh, we achieve that through through different um, sets of technology um, to ensure that private personal identifying information is is um, it can be transferred in a, in a private sort of manner. But the key there is to make sure it's not written to the the the, the fully visible blockchain node network. Um, distributed architecture. So once again, going back to the, the core technology design principles that we talked about earlier in that um, everything we do is, is working towards a decentralized, distributed and diverse set of architectures. And I think it goes without saying, but uh, security. So it's a huge consideration in everything we do, um, not just in the architectural design, um, but also the build, uh, how we deploy it and how we support and operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, such a huge aspect. Um, I'm just going to pass back to Jake to take you through some other items. Thanks, Jake. Perfect. Cheers, Brett. So in addition to those uh, key areas of, uh, I suppose, technical or technology-related benefits, uh, there, there are also four key uh, areas of operational benefit here that you know we think are worth calling out. So um, in terms of payments, the primary 
transformational benefit is the ability to complete near real time payments on a 24 seven basis. Um, there will be possibilities for those payments to be used for uh, interbank and intercompany transactions, uh, but also for different purposes, uh, uh, we hope such as margin payments, uh, for instance, and in that example, a uh, finality payment system in the associated settlement asset can be used for the for the posting of initial and, and uh, or variation margin. Smart contract functionality uh, uh, could, could automate parts of that process uh, and improve capital efficiency along the way as well. Um, and uh, enhanced netting can also serve to reduce the need for, uh, for, for intraday liquidity. And we, we are definitely working with that in mind. Um, on new markets, uh, the purple quadrant there, uh, we've touched on the capacity for the on-chain uh, central bank money like uh, cash asset associated with finality payment systems to unlock the potential of tokenized assets uh, and a number of potential avenues for development uh, in the space are articulated here. The common theme uh, for, for all of these is that the, the, there already exist several uh, use cases for tokenized assets across securities, commodity, property, a uh, mul multitude of capital markets uh, related spaces, but without a high quality credit risk free cash asset in which to transact in them, their viability and uptake uh, crucially has remained niche in institutional spaces. Um, <clears throat> on operational resilience, it's uh, inherent that the distributed architecture that, that underpins our payment system that, that, that Brett touched on just uh, a minute ago, uh, the single points of failure and the capacity for cyber attacks are reduced, uh, if not eliminated, uh, not to mention the already discussed cost effectiveness uh, that's inherent in such a solution. Um, uh, as mentioned, we're architecting our payment systems with both forward facing and backwards facing interoperability in mind. Uh, yes, we want to uh, enable our participants to leverage the potential of an emerging uh, uh, asset class, uh, as just said, but we also recognize that it's essential to remain compatible uh, and interoperable with legacy systems too. Um, finally, on balance sheet management there, the potential for reduced liquidity buffers uh, and reduced need for correspondent uh, banking relationships has also been discussed. Uh, and all of this provides for reduced risk and a greater balance sheet management capability. Um, in some quantitative analysis work that we undertook at Finality, uh, we found that a 25% reduction in uh, intraday liquidity requirements can translate into savings of up to $75 million annually for large banks. Um, and it's at the heart of the Finality payment system as a value proposition to make uh, dramatic reductions in liquidity costs uh, possible for its user. So this, this is all well and good, um, but moving on to the final slide, ultimately all, all our ideas, uh, use cases and benefits, everything we've discussed in this presentation mean little without uh, tangible action to make them a reality. Uh, but fortunately, we believe we're uniquely placed in the market to succeed. Um, firstly, and perhaps most importantly, we uh, have close and long-standing relationships with our Inscope central banks, uh, stretching back many years to the days of the USC research project. Uh, the barrier to entry for, for any prospective competitor is necessarily high. Um, obviously, there's no way to develop and bring to market a regulated payment system uh, alongside no less a central bank money uh, a backed settlement asset without close and trusting relationships with uh, regulators and central banks themselves. Um, you may you may have seen quite recently that there was a major milestone in the market that you know finality were absolutely absolutely ecstatic about. Um, uh, we, we were delighted that the Bank of England uh, published a formal policy statement outlining the uh, uh, omnibus account eligibility criteria for for uh, innovative payment systems like finality. Um, and everyone here is very grateful to the bank uh, for their clear commitment to uh, ongoing industry innovation um, and having already submitted our application to the to the Bank of England uh, for this new type of omnibus account, we expect to fully comply with the uh, bank's policy in delivering novel use cases um, across peer to peer settlement uh, with a new sterling finality payment system, 100% um, backed by uh, fiat currency funds held with the central bank. Alongside this, excuse me, we've uh, also submitted a letter of intent um, to formally initiate the opening of a central bank account uh, at another major in scope uh, central bank and we're in collaboration with their technical teams following this um, with a third major central bank uh, we are engaged on joint account requirements uh, and we've shared drafts of our rule book and core uh, account opening documentation um, and we anticipate that the uh, the recent re the recently released policy from the bank of england will uh, 
do much to open similar paths to approval in uh, our other in-scope jurisdictions. Um, secondly, then, uh, in addition to that, our shareholder-led consortium model uh, is another major differentiating factor. You saw them all on uh, the first slide uh, earlier. Um, all of our shareholders are very active participants in the, in the governance, technical development and strategic direction of finality. Um, and they've been instrumental in defining our core use cases, uh, the first of which are now in active development uh, bank side. Um, thirdly, uh, and finally, following the onboarding of several delivery partners, uh, you know, in the fields of software development, security, blockchain development, and more, um, our shareholders are now in receipt of a functionally complete uh, version of our uh, 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 finality access software, which is a key part of our product suite um, that, that we can discuss further in uh, breakout sessions uh, for anyone who's interested. Um, and we're engaged in testing uh, continuous feedback and development processes um, and the transfer of value between participants in a test environment currently. Um, so I'm, that's, those are all the slides we have. Um, more than happy to uh, open the floor for questions uh, on uh, anything in this presentation or indeed anything beyond it. That, that leaves the whole world open. Um, anything in this or anything outside? Uh, I, I would leave, um, uh, I would ask people to ask questions um, right now. Uh, please uh, put up your hands if you want to, and that's, you know, good form. Um, and that way we can man manage the uh, uh, people who want to ask questions. And uh, so there seemed to be one from Paolo, who's of course a well-known player in this arena, having worked on the Mint project. So uh, he is asking a question. Would you say that you are a natural evolution to RTGS systems? I'm, I'm happy to have a crack at that i think that's a it's an interesting question quite a broad one i think that inherent in a question like that one thing we you know we often get asked is uh that uh you know because we intend to settle on a real-time gross basis uh is, is that is that going backwards you know we want to be able to net payments if, if everything's settled gross like in fmps or like in an rtgs uh, in the current state uh you know liquidity needs would uh go through the roof and i, I suppose to get to the heart of that uh, question of, around being a natural evolution of RTGS systems. I think for more than 40 years now, uh, regulators have been moving financial markets towards gross settlement and away from uh, uh, other mechanisms like deferred net settlement, obviously driven by the Hirschstadt incident in the 70s. Uh, and I think this is because the market has recognized that gross settlement improves the risk characteristics of the market, uh, which sub substantially reduces the likelihood of uh, systemic risk. Um, and not only that, uh, instant settlement of payments uh, in an RTGS system or a payment system such as ours uh, can also enable, in line with one of our core goals, uh, improve liquidity management due to greater confidence on the timing of payments. Um, so in, in the sense that we are in line or a aligned with uh, a broader market trend, a broader regulator trend that has been going on for a number of decades now, and that we seek to achieve the same uh, risk reduction, uh, uh, systemic risk reduction uh, outcomes that regulators and RTGS system operators are seeking to achieve through their systems, then uh, 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 I would say perhaps that you know we are we are highly complementary to that. Yeah, and looks like um, your money's question sort of follows along the same lines, which is. Um, how will finality work with CBDCs, particularly mm. wholesale? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I CBDCs is a particular area of interest for me. So you've just set me off flipping. So I'll, 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 I have, I have plenty to say about, about this. Um, um, so please feel free to stop me at any time if you know I've taken the ball and run with it, running with it too far. Um, but look, I mean, while while you won't be running too far, believe me. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's see, shall we? So, um, look, um, 
we uh, whilst while CBDCs have experienced you know a surge of interest from from central banks and observers alike uh, the majority it's, it's worth noting first of all that the majority of that interest is centered around uh, retail CBDCs uh, which are obviously designed for use by the general public rather than wholesale CBDCs which are designed specifically for payments and settlements in the wholesale sector um, despite several high profile projects like uh, Ubin, Jasper, Stella, uh, others that I'm sure people are aware of, no wholesale CBDC project ha has yet gone live. Um, and in fact, the, the focus of, may of several major central banks, including the Bank of England, uh, has shifted somewhat from the pursuit of uh, wholesale CBDC to the incorporation of features of the underlying technology, i.e. DLT, uh, into RTGS renewal programs. Um, and I think it was a CPMI who I think probably put the rationale best in uh, uh, 2018. They said that, you know, all of these proofs of concept that uh, uh, have been done so far, despite being very interesting uh, uh, and, and complying with, you know, existing central bank system requirements relating to things like capacity, efficiency, robustness, they look broadly similar to and not so clearly superior to existing infrastructures. So the the absence of any wholesale CBDC solution yet live indicates that, you know, public sector institutions may instead wish to avail themselves of certain features of private sector well, innovations that such, well, such solutions wouldn't possess if they were based on traditional design choices. We can say the same thing about the finality. It's not live. Well, so hang on. So there's, <laughs> look, there's, there's so I mean, exception. you know, that to use the argument that it's not, it's not in production, um, uh, especially of a project. Mm -hmm. That has yep. dragged on for four more four plus years is okay. Kind of, yeah. uh, so, uh, you know. So as I think the look the the argument that that, that I was about to make uh, leverages around the 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 broad acceptance from everyone in the CBDC community on both sides, public and private, that both sides have a natural advantage for certain things. Um, look, central banks have a vital, indispensable role to play in bringing trust stability and regulation to any CBDC initiative. That's obviously not an area in which they just have an advantage. They're quite literally the only ones who can do it. Um, there can obviously be no CBDC without a central bank. Um, and at Finality, you know, we seek to innovate within their regulated framework. But on the other hand, and to answer your question around, uh, you know, why we are better placed to achieve, uh, why we believe we're better uh, placed to achieve the goals of uh, wholesale CBDC arrangements, uh, there are certain things that we might say that the private sector uh, has a natural advantage for. Things like uh, cross-border coordination, technological expertise, facilitating interoperability, maintaining the integrity of a DLT protocol. Uh, for example, a, a direct CBDC or a CBDC that's issued uh, you know, by a central bank uh, will find difficulty in leveraging any cross-border use case, including multi-currency PVP uh, solutions. And even in the domestic context, as well as the cross-border context, interoperability with uh, other settlement systems for delivery versus payment use cases, uh, we can anticipate that they'll face uh, similar challenges. Um, if if DLT-based, maintaining and coordinating a community of nodes or participants and you know, ensuring the integrity of a protocol that's maintained is outside the traditional expertise of, of, of central banks too. So the slide that you can still see on the screen is, uh, you know, we hope, uh, a clear indication of why we believe we're uniquely positioned to succeed and ready to go live, uh, you know, in in the in the near future, and certainly on a much uh, shorter time horizon than any uh, than any wholesale CBDC. Um, but I think the core argument beyond that is that all parties involved, we believe, stand to gain uh, from a fruitful kind of public-private sector collaboration. Uh, uh, ra rather than seeking to kind of achieve these goals uh, alone and in a, in, a, in, a, in a fragmented manner. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the argument to be made is that these are all going to coexist. Uh, you know, that definitely uh, seems to be the case. Today, cash coexists with com commercial bank money, with uh, RTGS systems that are directly uh, implemented as, with a... With a with the reserves, Fed now is working on that also to upgrade that. Uh, various, you know, so that that's happening. And also, your omnibus wallet idea is already implemented in RTGS in the U.S. Uh, you know, there are uh, 
there are mechanisms for do and uh, private companies, in fact, uh, doing that. But uh, how is there a room for uh, you know all these different? You know, basically, it's a fragmentation of your reserve itself. Uh, if you are a bank, that you will have to participate in multiple programs in order to uh, you know, take advantage of each one of them. But coming back to your point about uh, the, uh, whether multiple uh, currencies can be settled, I mean, you know that uh, the BIS has come away uh, considerably from their 2018 position in multiple ways, uh, including uh, the project called MCBDC, which is basically something similar to what you guys are attempting, but obviously uh, using central banks. So there are, you know, anyway, you can respond to those questions, but there are also others who are asking other questions. So mm. I can I can mm. go, uh, either we, could, we pursue that line of inquiry about, yeah, yeah. you know, whether, whether uh, you have, um, you are going to be threatened by these different, you know, different moves by central banks or whether you're going to coexist that is of course a business and a future you know prognosis mm. con uh, considerations which who knows mm. you know in my yeah. in my opinion uh so uh yeah no, absolutely I, i'm so i should say it's actually pretty prescient time and you know we're we're, we're currently uh uh we're uh, we're, we're authoring a uh uh paper slash blog post on the topic of multi CBDC. Uh, so I'll hold my tongue on that for now, just keep an eye on the, uh, you know, kind of finality uh, uh, website or LinkedIn. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that, that, you know, that will be uh, released to the world soon, which has our thoughts on that. Um, but just to address the fragmentation point that you made there, Vipin, I think that's one that's worth, uh, uh, you know, just a, a kind of a short response to, uh, you know, you say that it, it, the argument of, you know, banks having to fund an extra pot of liquidity if you like you know to participate in kind of novel payment system initiatives and if that creates fragmentation question being how do you provide efficiency gains if this is the case to which uh, uh, uh we would say you know typically a new payment system will create an overhead as funds are transferred uh you know from from, from one account and control of the funds provider to another account and control of the intermediary but that's not actually the case with with, with the finality payment system um at all times the funds provider will have the opportunity to instantly transfer funds to anyone participating in the local RTGS uh, by defunding, and that will be on an instant basis. Um, so the only actual overhead will be to track the separate part of funds, but this is almost this is almost certainly something that's being done by the relevant treasury function as so a funds will, provider anyway. We've, so will there be you know, a, we've designed it. Sorry, go on. So will there be a bank run on the omnibus wallet, <laughs> which is what you're suggesting here? <laughs> Well, not quite. I think that it's, it's more <laughs> I mean, about if you it's can more, it's more instantly of... transfer money from, uh, you know, let's say the finality omnibus wallet to the, you know, let's say ACH omnibus wallet, some other mm. omnibus wallet. Then you're, you know, then you are, are under risk of uh, uh, liquidity starvation, uh, which will put a big crimp in your uh, in your uh, operations. So that's probably being protected by some other means by saying, okay, you've got to at least give us some warning or you have to have a minimum mark. You got to have some kind of a, uh, you know, low water mark and a high water mark, you know, some, some other ways of uh, protecting a consortium yeah. like finality. Yeah, it goes to, it goes to governance arrangements, doesn't it? I think ultimately to, 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 uh, you know, enforce, <clears throat> Behavior that's consistent with, you know, access requirements uh, promulgated by central banks, and also behavior that, you know, isn't detrimental to monetary or financial stability. And I think that, you know, but, but by working very closely uh, and establishing long-term relationships with these target central banks, you know, we can allow them to at all times um, uh, exercise control over who has access to to these uh, uh, this the settlement asset that is part of a finality payment system. And therefore, uh, uh, in conjunction with a robust legal arrangement in the form of the rule book that uh, uh, participants will be effect expected to sign up to, uh, you know, any any behaviour 
that would cause such a detriment, we, we, you know, we would hope would be prevented. And there is another question from Boulevard, which says, is uh, Finality best leveraged as a payment system or as a settlement system? Any chance at disrupting uh, SWIFT GPI substantially? Question mark. Uh, Brett, feel free to jump in. I can have a go at that. Um, I perhaps, what's that? Let me, I'm sorry, I'm just going to read the question in the chat so I can see it back. It's finality right. best leverage right. as a payment system or a settlement. Okay, so on disruption. Okay. Um, I'm not sure this is going to answer the question directly, but maybe it's uh, around is finality. Uh, you know, on, on, on the subject of disrupt, disrupting potential competitors, is finality, you know, a, a winner all takes play? Is it, you know, is it getting to the heart of, you know, do you need to capture the vast majority of payment flows or uh, risk undermining the business model? Is that maybe what that question is getting at? Yeah, I mean, uh, the point uh, is that SWIFT is the, uh, you know, is the, mm. at least the retail payment system of choice mm. or B2B, which is, you know, definitely not, may participate in wholesale. But um, mm. uh, so, you know, I know that, for example, Swift uh, is really in charge of the ISO 20 or 20, 22, really. Mm. I mean, if you think about it, although it is supposed to be a union of all the messaging standards. And uh, the Bank of England uh, and even the uh, Fed and others have voted on uh, going using ISO 20 or 22. Uh, mm. But of course, they are also uh, thinking about the security and privacy of that. So Money says he wants to ask a question about that. I would, I would ask him to... Um, you know, ask a question about the security and privacy aspects. Mm. Because SWIFT um, is famous for being hacked. So, because... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, th thanks guys. Um, uh, this is Manny from uh, OTC Digital. Um, you know, last year under Hyperledger um, uh, Capital Market SIG, we did a prototype implementation of uh, eTaller. I'm not sure if we've been at discuss this before. It's just simply how do we implement CBDC on a um, on a uh, enterprise Ethereum? Exact same thing as you guys suggested, Hyperledger Besu and the IDFT protocol. We implemented, we tested it with participants. Uh, the issues that came up were uh, uh, mostly around uh, privacy and particularly with uh, solidity uh, because uh, any node participant can see all the transactions uh, unless it is completely secured you know, uh, with like zero knowledge proof and also computation using uh, uh, you know, um, uh, more secure uh, uh, encryption mechanisms. Uh, all participant node, node participants can see each other's activities. How does uh, finality you know, work around that issue? Do you want me to cover? A bit of that, Jake? Please, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, so um, we, we, we touched very briefly at a high level on privacy um, on one of the previous slides. So um, the, way we, the way we do it currently is we make sure that um, there's no personal identifying data that gets written to the blockchain. Um, yeah, that's the one there. So what, what we are looking at to facilitate that is having a private messaging layer that sits alongside um, the blockchain node network. So, yeah, um, some of the some of the participants participants may wish to uh, send some PII data in in some of the messages um, that, that they transfer to other banks. Um, there needs to be a way in our data model model that we separate that data and make sure that um, yeah any of that stuff is, is 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 totally separate. So, yeah, the way that we're doing it is having a separate private channel um, to to deal with that. I mean, in general, ERC, ERC, talk, ERC contracts, basically any solidity contract, any, uh, all node participants can see since this is being a decentralized um, system. Uh, in a sense, if, uh, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if, for example, if Barclays wants to, you know, is interacting uh, with State Street, 
UBS can listen to because it is a, you know, this is a ERC-20-20 token. Sure. How do we prevent that? Uh, well, at, at the moment, for most of the, uh, the transfer data, we, we don't. Um, we did quite a lot of analysis as part of the research project, uh, the, the research phases of the project to understand that most of that data is, is not going to be able to fac facilitate the participants um, changing markets with. Um, uh, Jake, I don't, I don't know if you've got anything further to, to add to that. Um, no, nothing to add to that at the moment, I don't, if, that, if that answers your question. Manny, unless you have any follow-on questions from that. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we can follow up separately because, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's five can, minutes left. Yeah, so there, there I, don't, I don't been... to, maybe we can set up a call separately. I, can, I have a couple of other questions as well. Yeah, yeah and it, if, I just wanted to say that uh, Manny and I wrote a paper in which we propose a pattern which is very similar to what you have said, but we do more than that. I mean, both, both of those, um, there are two blockchains involved. One is for bilateral uh, agreements, which are more than just PII, it is contracts, in fact. And then uh, the other, uh, other chain is more to harbor the token and to be uh, able to uh, transact freely because the token in order to be useful has to be uh, transparent uh, in a certain way because uh, if, you know, and, and people talk about private tokens all the time. They, I mean, I haven't seen uh, real uh, implementations of that unless it is uh, in e-currency, e I think. Those guys are working with Jamaica uh, Central Bank to do that, but that is not black based on blockchain because uh, once you can see the transactions, then you know. So they, they are they are doing something else, but it's um, anyway. So I mean, I, I would I just I, I I would just dip in if you can forward our uh, white paper to them, and then maybe yes. you know, follow up, call, and then we can come back and share it with the with the hyperledger group uh, in the next subsequent week. That'll be great. Uh, I think that'd be good. So um, th there has been a lot of discussion, um, certainly in my time in uh, 18 months at Finality around the whole privacy piece. Um, yeah, it's, it's generated a lot of conversation. I can see how, how you guys have managed to write a white paper on it. So yeah. It, it's, not yeah just on the, it's not just on privacy anyway. Privacy is just one of the aspects because when you're proposing a solution, it has to cover all the, all the different bases. Yep. Um, Paolo, uh, do you have anything else? Uh, um, it's 10.57. Yeah, from my side, just to say that I'm really happy to have this discussion and see the continued interest. I really have to drop off to another call, but this is great to be a participant in these conversations. So thank you for, for organizing this, Vipin. Oh, you're welcome. I'm always interested in this. Uh, that's why I was telling Jake that uh, he won't be going too far, you know, running too far away from us because we are, we are right there with you guys. <laughs> Maybe we are not as well funded. <laughs> That's yeah, all. Just to add one more item, uh, we would like to explore this also. Uh, one more item to explore also. You know, we are re we are reaching out to FCA uh, uh, regarding a digital asset, and that's something that we are very interested in seeing how Finality could help us. So we can we can have these conversations uh, after after this. So. Because we are interested in the whole enchilada, sure. or whole enchilada, not <laughs> just a payment piece, you know. So <laughs> with that, with that, when I when I say enchilada, I mean today is Cinco de Mayo, and let's celebrate uh, with the enchiladas. <laughs> anyway, I, I think that's the key thing: is is the finality. What we're trying to build at finality is a is an ecosystem. So um, yeah, having having conversations with. Central business uh, partners is, is quite a key thing. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, that, that's everything that we have. I'm very happy to obviously take any questions uh, offline as well. I know the confines of an hour and, uh, you know, sometimes not enough. It's gone very dark here as well. Sorry if you can barely see me. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we happy to continue the conversation elsewhere. But thank you for the opportunity to deliver this today. Beautiful. Thanks. Thanks to you. Thank guys. you both for joining. Yeah, wonderful. Karen, oh, appreciate thank it. you guys. Take Anything? care then, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation.